So first off, uh, thank you for, for organizing this and having me. This is actually my very first life itself um, community gathering, uh, and I find myself presenting on it about a topic which I'm rather passionate about. So thank you for giving me a, a stage to, to discuss about uh, consciously creating change. Um, but before I dive in, I, I suppose, let me give a little bit of background as to who I am and, and how I've come about doing what I'm doing. Uh, so I used to be a management consultant focusing on strategy, uh, where I worked in London for a number of years. And my passion uh, for my, uh, from that aspect of my, my, my life, my work life was around understanding systemic change, so how to help companies change and uh, practically implementing it. Uh, but I've always possessed a passion for understanding the inner workings of my mind and understanding how individuals can change at a personal level. And the more and more I, I researched, the connection between changing at an organizational level, uh, the more it linked back to the individual and changing at the inner level. Uh, so I, I grew fascinated by this, uh, this kind of back and forth between the inner and the outer when, when going to create change. And then there came a moment in my life in 2020 where I had a very abrupt change where I moved countries, I uh, you know, changed jobs, and I had... Uh, you know, my parents divorcing and uh, kind of relationships breaking down as well. And lots of things came together and it, and it gave me kind of firsthand insight into all the theory I'd been reading about, so the challenges of actually creating change. So I wanted to, I suppose, unpack the, uh, you know, the, the, the experiential, you know, the embodied experiences which I've had when it comes to navigating major life changes, when the pillars of your life um, you know, start shifting and you have to relay the foundations. Uh, and also I wanted to um, provide a formula which I've derived from synthesizing lots of various uh, research plus you know, ancient texts plus science. Um, five key principles which I believe are universal to creating change. So without uh, further ado, I'm going to dive in and start presenting my screen. Play. Can, can people see my screen? Can people give me a thumbs up? Yeah, okay, nice. So um, this uh, talks about the art of intentionally creating our futures. And we're, ex we're exploring the, uh, the art of consciously creating change, um, both within ourselves and at the systemic level. So I've already gone into a bit about myself, uh, but, but uh, now uh, after um, working as a management consultant, post um, you know, changing country and leaving jobs, I'm now the founder of Inner Compass Academy, which is an online community focused on helping people to navigate the, the inner dynamics, the inner dimensions of, uh, of change from a heart-centered place. I'll go a bit more into this uh, later on in the, uh, in the presentation. And um, I like to begin these kind of talks with a quote uh, and the um, one that stuck, stuck out for me uh, when preparing this was not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced, which is a quote by American writer James Baldwin. And I feel there is a lot of truth to this at the moment, based on what we're seeing in the world today, we're coming up and facing lots of monumental uh, challenges, lots of crises. Um, but at the same time, this gives us an opportunity to create change off the back of them. So for instance, there's been papers on global warming since the 70s or even earlier. Uh, yet when we're coming to a front with the impacts of global warming, that's when we can actually catalyze that change, I believe, as one example. So, we, uh, so this talks about consciously creating change. So it makes sense to talk about what the, the alternative is, you know, the, un the unconscious aspect of change. And unconscious change isn't necessarily a bad thing. It sometimes it's required to instigate. Uh, it's required to, to uh, you know, start a fire to, to shake things up, to disrupt a, a system which isn't working. Um, and this is, this is what you see with, uh, with big you know, with kind of you know, protests that turn violent or you know, abrupt changes where suddenly you have a, an idea and, 
and you think, okay, I'm going to follow through with it. And you end up quitting your job and changing country like me. And then you've got to think about how to rebuild things uh, from a conscious place. Because when you go about breaking things and breaking existing systems, breaking down existing relationships and connections you have in your life, then that's a great catalyst for change. And that can propel you to a different path. But at the same time, you need to be mindful that uh, you need to take the appropriate steps to rebuild the foundations um, which you have disrupted. And um, one analogy I like to draw upon is from the San people of South Africa. And um, they, they are a tribal nomadic uh, community living in, in South Africa. They, they are connected very deeply to the land and to nature. And this is an, an idea I got from a podcast I was listening to uh, with John Young. It was the Life Worlds podcast. And he describes these people uh, who uh, talk about energetic threads connecting them to life around them. And they, they link this through example of connections to uh, nature, to a tree. And so they would, they would name everything. They would walk through the, the forest, they would name trees, they would name animals, they would name um, plants, and they would form these deep connections with the land that they inhabited. And this idea of energetic threads, it can also be applied to us, but I think the word energetic is interchangeable with the word emotional. We have emotional threads that attach us to the current way of being. These threads, they connect us uh, at the kind of a macro large sense. So we are connected to the ecosystem we live in. We're connected to mother earth. Uh, we're connected to the systems which provide our, our food and our, our security. But also we're connected to much, um, we're connected to things that bring us joy, things that bring us connection. And those emotional connections could be anything. And I think it's important to, when, when trying to understand how to change things at a systemic level, understand where people's emotional connections are. And I think this is where, or maybe a topic that people overlook in the political debates, and, and they, they don't quite understand why people feel so strongly about a point of view. It's not so much the point of view, it's the underlying emotional threads that that, um, that point of view uh, kind of points to indirectly. So one example I can draw upon on this, uh, so something which uh, maybe for an outside perspective, people might not understand, but for me growing up, I was a really avid gamer and I, I put lots of hours into World of Warcraft. This is one of my, uh, my favorite MMOs. I, I, I put tons and tons of time, maybe a thousand plus hours in growing up into it. And before going to university, I deleted my accounts because I didn't want it distracting my studies. And for anyone who's played MMOs, like deleting you know, this year you know, and accounts is almost unheard of because it's, it's almost like the, the world that you create, um, the character you create and the world that you inhabit through these characters, it's part of your identity. Because you, you go into this world for connection or for individual expression. And, um, and for me, it was very challenging, but I did it because I had a vision. I had an idea of what I wanted to create. I didn't want to be held back. Um, so I, 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 I took a difficult decision to cut this thread, but I did it. Now, there is, uh, this, this is the point I want to highlight. There's this huge difference between the consciously choosing to cut old threads versus it being forced upon us. And there's a video that went viral quite some time ago of a, of a brother filming a kid who, who uh, had his World of Warcraft accounts deleted and from the reaction from this video you can see that it is extremely traumatic for this kid and i'll just play a little bit of a clip just to show how difficult you know, when change is forced upon you without you having choice in the matter especially if it's something meaningful so i, I won't play the whole clip but I hope it gives you a sense that when, when we cut our threads, threads to things that are meaningful to us um, and that matter to us and give us a sense of connection, a sense of creativity, a sense of joy, uh, it can leave us very, very much untethered. And like a ship in the middle of the ocean, you don't really know which direction you might want to go in. Uh, it can be a, quite an uncomfortable place to be. 
and it's a vulnerable place to be as well. So to, from being in that place myself for some time and, and uh, being around other people who found themselves in this place, I, I find that one of the most important things that we can do is to hold space for these people who are going through big life transitions, who are in these states of limbo, uh, who've cut old, you know, cut threads to the old ways of life and are looking to explore something new. And it's also empower those people with a choice of consciously creating their future, as opposed to futures being handed down to them. And this is what I, I hope to do through my community. So Inner Compass is, um, is about creating a space for people to, uh, to navigate change, essentially. It's to navigate the inner dimensions of change. So I host journaling calls and um, create a, a container for people to come together and to uh, connect at a human level. So there's so much noise and so much, uh, I think, uh, so much of a, a show or a pretense being put up in, in, many, uh, in many aspects of life, many areas of life, that I think communities, like life itself, uh, are so valuable. Yeah, I see them as oases uh, for people who are looking for authentic connection and a place to figure out um, how to navigate their future. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to create a, uh, as I put it, a sanctuary for the inner explorer. So as you're going through this period of limbo is a place where you feel safe to explore different possible futures. And now I come on to this, uh, this formula I alluded to, the formula for conscious creation. And uh, it's something I've, I've put together based on lots of, lots of time researching into the, the aspects of change and how, how change comes about. And uh, I've kept it, essentially distilled it. You know, it. This started out being much more complicated. If you can imagine when I was trying to figure this out, I had a like huge A3 paper, I had whiteboards, I had arrows, I had lots of different things. And essentially I've distilled it down to five things, which I'll elaborate on now. Um, first being intention. So intention is arguably the starting point. It's this, the direction which you set for when you're going out and seeking to create some kind of change in your life. If you think back to the example of the boat at sea, if you're dropped in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, the, at this moment, you have a choice of sailing, let's say, east or west. You know, and the decision you make at that point is going to take you to a different continent. So the intentions, they can be very large in scale. You can have these big macro intentions whereby they decide the, a new path or a new direction for your future. But they can also be smaller in scale. For instance, you will never... Uh, you will never be a renowned pastry chef if you don't have an intention to, to get into, to go into the kitchen and start cooking or to experiment with baking. Yeah, so the intention is that initial starting point is the seeds, seeds of ideas that get planted. And we are presented with different intentions, you know, different possible futures at, uh, at many points in our life. And the, the key is simply to be open to the ones that feel alive and feel exciting for us. And then once we have an intention, that sets our initial direction on our compass. And then we move on to vision being the second ingredient. And whenever you seek to create some kind of change, let's say you have, as I, said, I don't know why I chose pastry chef, let's say you have a vision of being a famed pastry chef uh, or, an, or an intention to become a, a famed pastry chef. If you don't have some kind of vision or image in your mind's eye as to what that might look like, it's gonna be very hard to get there because there's a huge gap between vision and it being actualized in, in reality. So vision is what fills in the, the blanks, fills in the details as to what it might look like in, in a future state. And as you go through creating changes, they can be extremely emotionally taxing and very difficult to keep going because you might you know, one day be extremely infused by the idea of this, but then one week on, uh, the practicalities of life get in the way. The you know, day-to-day the, the -day chores and the grind and the pressures and the obligations, they will come and try and knock you off course. And if you don't have that 
vision as to where you want to get to and you keep coming back to it and strengthening it, I'm not saying that it has to be just the same uh, throughout the entirety of it. If a vision can change and evolve and, and organically emerge over time, but it needs to be there. Otherwise you will lose touch with the bigger picture. The third ingredient is awareness. And while this is a very broad term, I like to think about awareness in two distinct um, aspects. The first being internal awareness and the second being external awareness. So internal awareness is extremely important to have when you're going through a, period of, a big period of change. So let's say you've cut threads to your old ways of life, you've kind of shifted, shifted the, the foundations, the pillars in which your life is built and you're trying to, to create something new, go in a new direction, then it can be very taxing for your body. Uh, having awareness of what your body's telling you, so some, like somatic awareness, as it's called, awareness of your nervous system is, is really critical because you might have, your mind might have a really grand idea of where you might want to be, but you need to take your body along on the ride with you. And sometimes if you throw yourself in a situation where you're not ready for, it can be really jarring for your nervous system. And it can ultimately result in overwhelm and burnout, which also happened to me. So I'm, I'm speaking from, <laughs> from, from personal experience also. Uh, and the, the other aspect is, uh, well, I suppose another point on the internal aspect. So the internal, Another the internal aspect I want to mention is um, is the different forms of intelligence that we have, or different forms of um, of knowing, and we come to kind of heart intelligence and gut intelligence, which is something which um, science is is now making new breakthroughs in, and as opposed to humans just having the the brain making the decisions, is actually the case that our gut has a huge influence on on the uh, the choices we make and also our heart. And when we have this coherence between the three, that's when we make the most informed decisions. So we can bring a full awareness to our body and how we're making decisions. Then that's when we, we operate from the most empowered place. And then we have um, external awareness. And that's being aware of what you're getting yourself into. So you might be a very Zen, like you know everything about how you're working in your inner world. And that's great. But then if you don't understand how to make change in the outer world, so you'll want to go become a pastry chef, but you've never picked up a rolling pin and made pastry, but you don't know how, uh, you know, how to get a scholarship or a grant or, um, or go to get in the right you know, you know, patisserie, uh, then you're not going to be able to get too far. And it's by having external awareness, that's when you start researching, understanding what's out there around you and how that can contribute to uh, creating change from this place of awareness as opposed to fumbling in the dark. And then next ingredient we have is strategy. And uh, strategy is when the, the intangible becomes more tangible. So we think at the beginning we had intention, we had vision. Uh, these are very intangible in nature. Also awareness, maybe not quite as, as much, but also is, is intangible, is all mind-based. Um, and body-based and now a strategy where we're moving more into the tangible so we've we've figured out what, what we want to be doing we have our intention set we have a vision crystallized we understand the lay of the land and now strategy is about getting from point a to point b so this is actually making making the intangible tangible how, how can we do it and while there is lots of talk around strategy uh, being you know, really important, really key strategy by itself actually isn't um, isn't going to work. And I'll go in a bit more detail as to what's going to happen if we miss each one of these components. Um, because strategy is all about planning, but then if you have planning without the other elements, then uh, you end up being in kind of like project management nightmare. So I used to work in consulting, and and I used to work with project managers, and it's all about the strategy, and you know, we need to re-strategize every week. There's a new strategy. But then the other, and that's because the other elements were missing. And uh, this is when you end up moving chairs on the Titanic in some cases where you keep on strategizing. Um, so strategy is really important, but it also needs to be paired with the other ingredients. And um, to reiterate, strategy is about putting the steps in place to get from point A where you're at right now 
Um, and that's where awareness comes in to understand where you're at right now. And then to point B as to where you want to get in the future, which is your vision. And then finally, we have action, which is making manifest every, everything we talked about. The other four components were all intangible. They're all in the mind. Um, this is, uh, they're not actually out there in the world yet. And I, I strongly believe that change, a lot of the change does come first from the inside, which is, which what, come, which is what comes back to the, uh, the idea at the beginning I presented of how there's this dance between the inner and the outer. And whilst action is the only one that gets seen in the outside world, I believe all of us have gone through uh, in many, many layers of internal changes and, and um, kind of new ways of understanding and new ways of, of seeking to be uh, from the earlier stages. And action is when finally we go out into the world and we create those changes. And I want to stress here that there's no, it's not, it's not I suppose, a linear, um, a linear uh, formula. It's much like baking a cake, you know, each ingredient goes in. And I suppose some go in earlier than others, but all are, all are required. And, um, and some, are, you know, some can be interchanged in terms of the order they go in because action is uh, you know, something which can happen at the kind of a small level of you. An action might be to sit down to meditate um, each morning, that's an action. Or an action could go and uh, put a put a CV in for an interview or to go actually uh, start a new job. Um, but ultimately action is where the rubber meets the road and the things that you've been visioning uh, and, and researching and strategizing about starts, starts materializing. And what I propose people to do with this formula is to, to ask themselves, you know, what, what is the intention or a big intention that they have and which one of these ingredients is missing. And if you don't know a, a big intention that you might be holding, then maybe that's the ingredient that's missing. Um, so whenever you're going through a period of change, it's useful to come back and look at this. And uh, you know, I can relate to this in, in starting my business in that I was very visionary at the beginning of my business. And I had all these ideas, but then when it comes to actually implementing it in the action stage, I lose touch with the initial vision of what I was trying to create as I go to the, go through the day-to-day -day grind. Um, so it's a real constant reminder for me as well to check in to see where, where which one of these ingredients is out of balance. So this is the, um, the formula for conscious creation. I, um, I realized that we're at the halfway point and I wanted to only talk for half an hour. So I'm gonna open the floor for questions now so we can have a, a discussion on this topic. And, um, Oh, just before I do that, I just want to come back to this kind of difference between conscious change and unconscious change. And now um, I was hoping to, I suppose, draw a, a distinction after having discussed it. Uh, unconscious change is a bit more, is more reactive, abrupt and untethering in nature. And yes, that might be necessary to kind of instigate it. But as conscious change is what we want to uh, move towards after we've gone through an abrupt untethering um, period. And at a kind of collective scale, we could think about the pandemic as this, which is a big shock. But then after that shock, we want to be mindful in intentionally, gradually creating change from an empowered place. And that's it. So I'll open the floor for questions now. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, feel free to just un unmute yourself and I can go for it in any questions. Yeah, and would you mind um, unsharing your screen as well so we can oh, see each yes. other? Thanks. Go, Matt. I have a question. Um, yeah. Thank you for the talk, by the way. I thought it was really informative. Um, so with the difference of conscious and unconscious change, um, it kind of seems like unconscious, unconscious change is if I understood it correctly, kind of mostly like viewed in a negative sense, but I think there's also a degree to which over time, if you do conscious change or like intentional change, that there is an unconscious change that kind of clicks in over time. Um, do, do you follow like what I mean there? I, I, get, I get you. Yeah. The, the thread that you're, you're going right. down. Um, so like to what, 
to what degree is like, yeah, unconscious change also a good thing in your opinion? Because I think over time there is like a sense in which there can be good unconscious change if you mm. follow conscious change. Yeah, no, un understood. And um, actually I realized after I put together a presentation that maybe the choice of imagery wasn't maybe quite fair for the um, the two distinctions, that they kind of the the kind of the image of of um, kind of rioters and fire from the unconscious change and and um there is there is value to both and i don't want to i think say that unconscious is bad and conscious is good but i, I i'm um i'm in the camp of there there needs to be a balance to everything and um the, the ideas that come to mind for unconscious change is where let's say people say someone might watch a documentary about um overfishing for instance and then then they become an activist of like you know i now need to tell everyone i know all my family members that um you know, to, to stop eating fish and that's very admirable but to i think create change at a broader scale um it's good to i think not come at it just from this kind of reactive state but to have more of a a measured approach to mm -hmm. it um so i i think unconscious change it, it lights a fire it gets you started it, it's it's there to to instigate but it's, you're ultimately going to run into problems along the way um and what i say by conscious change is by applying those say five ingredients by checking in it's, it wasn't my intention what's my my vision for this Am I fully aware of what's of the situation? Am I taking action? It's kind of a checklist to see, am I coming at creating change from a uh, kind of a, a balanced place as mm -hmm. opposed to an unbalanced place? And I think that balance or unbalanced is probably the best way to, uh, to frame it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matthew. Anyone else have any questions for Jan? I have some. I have some thoughts. Like what you were saying triggered quite a few different um, elements. Like um, in relation to um, Gabor Mate and the concept of like um, when you have the choice between authenticity and attachment, attachment mm -hmm. or triumph, and how that can often be an unconscious factor that we're not aware of is the initial attachment and how that is moving us away from being um, authentic. Um, so I'm just going to throw out some thoughts. These aren't necessarily questions. And then also with Jung, like, until we make the unconscious conscious, it will direct our life and we will call it fate kind of mm. awareness or <laughs> a quote, so to speak, because often we don't necessarily have that awareness so I guess I suppose if I was to formulate this into a question do you feel that sometimes people will make conscious changes but that they are actually directed unconsciously oh interesting question so will people make changes can you repeat one more time just so I get my yeah opinion. so do people make conscious changes hmm. but these con Conscious changes are actually directed unconsciously. Oh, yes. I think, you yeah, no, I, I get where you're coming from. So I think, oh, yeah, the unconscious is always directing us in certain, in, down certain paths. And I, I don't want to kind of start a war between the conscious and the conscious, subconscious, saying the, the conscious is good, subconscious is bad. Um, and I, I would argue that actually like there's a trap here of overthinking of like oh am i making this change consciously um and that that i think is a dangerous place to to be in i think it's it's more it's more of a kind of a flip between the two um so you would kind of start off not really knowing what you're doing um it may be kind of unco you know, unconsciously you know that something's not right so you start creating some changes you know you you think like you have a this idea that oh I, you know, I'm if things aren't going well for me here or maybe I just don't, something doesn't feel right about uh, it, this kind of aspect of my life this area of my life I'm gonna um, you know, I'm gonna change it I'm going to quit my job and it might come from nowhere but then after you've quit your job you got to figure out how are you then going to um, go forwards from that moment 
And that's when it kind of flips back to the, okay, okay let's get have some conscious decision-making and conscious change-making. And then you want to check in, okay, after oh, so I'm now unemployed, what is my, what are my options? Uh, then what's my intention? Do I have a vision for where I want to be? Do I have some awareness of how I can bring about that vision and a strategy, et cetera? I'm not saying you have to think about all five of these at once. They're going to come on, kind of organically come to you. But just by having this framework in mind, it's just there to, I think, remind you that if you're feeling a bit stuck, and I, I, I say, I, I like to, um, the preface is saying that this, this framework is good if you're feeling a bit confused, a bit stuck, or a bit directionless, is, is great for journaling or for introspection. And we think like, oh, actually, I had this great idea of doing this, but now I, I'm not making any progress. And then you can check in with yourself honestly, like, oh, am I bringing full awareness to how, you know, A, this is making my body feel, or awareness to what's required to create this change? And you think, oh, maybe not. Um, or do I actually have a strategy for how I'm going to do this? And if you're not a person who is great at strategy, then get someone to help you to do that. Or if you're not someone who's great at action taking, then get someone who's a real action taker to come in and, and support you. So I'm also not saying that you need to be the one doing all five of these things. And as you create changes within communities, um, then you can have different people who are better at different aspects. And if you go back to tribal cultures, you have the, the shaman in the tent who was the visionary and you, he would commune with the spirits. And then he would pass it on to the, the others in the tribe, the elders, and the elders would then pass it on to the, the hunter-gatherers and the warriors. Um, so each person had their role. Um, but that's when you're living together in a close-knit community. Um, when you're there by yourself, uh, you can you know, keep being mindful that you can tap into your network. But it's also good to have a kind of overarching view of uh, kind of the mechanisms or dynamics of, of how change works. Thank you. Yeah, because I guess uh, this can often seem quite overwhelming for people, even if they're as a driver of consciously making some changes. And the sort of your um, five pillars, so to speak, are often can often feel so huge within themselves mm. that yeah, yeah. I guess people can maybe sort of not um, not necessarily want to start or be overwhelmed with starting. So if somebody mm. was at the point where they, you know, are following this this train of thought they're connecting to it but they feel a bit frozen what would be what would be like the initial easy way in to make this actually feel much more manageable to to work with i, I would say uh, start small um so if you look instead of saying i'm going to completely you know, up, you know, upend my life and change job and start a business or whatever that's huge start much smaller and think at a personal level, like apply this to building a new habit, for instance, let's say oh, I, I really wanted to get into, um, into yoga, uh, build a yoga practice. Yeah, how can I do that? And I think where people fall short is they have the initial intention. They have kind of a short burst of motivation, but then they fall off. And if you start applying this to say building a yoga practice, okay, you have the intention. I mean, okay, give a vision of where you want to be with this yoga practice. Cause if you have a vision of, um, being more flexible, for instance, or being able to do a handstand or a headstand, then that's already more motivating. And then you start bringing awareness to it. But then awareness would be yoga videos, learning about yoga. Um, and then whilst you're doing yoga, listen to your body, be present with your body. How's it feeling? And that brings you more emotionally into that experience. And then do you have a strategy, as in maybe a strategy in this example would be do yoga twice a week for two months? That's your strategy, that's your plan. And then, um, and then you take action by actually going and doing it each time and showing up on the map. So when I give this formula, it's, it's not for people to do dramatic, drastic things with it. But if you're trying to you know, even do something very small, like cook different, you know, cook more healthily in the kitchen, um, then you can still apply this formula and kind of check in um, with you know, whether you, you're you're being able to apply it or not. And it might help you identify gaps as to why you can't put in place new habits or routines. Yeah, and I just wanted to ask like, um, yeah, first of all, thank you. I, I really appreciate the, uh, the idea, the concept. And um, I'm curious, like from your experience where you find people most stumble during this, this process, like what's the bit they find hardest to kind of, 
either put down on paper or even like overcome or put into action, I guess. Um, so I, I feel um, I feel people have a pretty good aware, like awareness um, in general of as they something something needs to change. They have a kind of a good internal awareness like oh I need to change this thing, and then you maybe set an intention off the back of that like oh you know, I know that me watching Netflix for three hours every day when I get home that's not good you know I need to change that so you have an intention. And then you might put a strategy in place. You're like, okay, I'm going to you know, hide the remote, for instance, switch or, you know, or like, do something to stop you from, from doing that. But then I feel, I feel um, vision is maybe a bit underrated. Um, and it kind of comes back to this, um, this, this other theory, this other premise I was talking about, these kind of um, these emotional threads which attach you to things. So you watching Netflix for three hours when you get home, you're getting some utility out of that. Some uh, you have that kind of connection to it. You're getting something from it. You're connecting with with the art of cinema, the art of of, uh, of TV screenwriting. So at the moment, the changes you're trying to create are maybe detracting something. But can you create a vision of what you might do in the place of watching Netflix? Do you have a vision? vision for coming home and taking up a new project or like some kind of craft activity as opposed to just sitting in the house staring at a wall. Um, that's like that's an extreme example, but you need, I think, something to fill the void. And that's where vision comes in, imagination comes in. Um, and I think that's an area which is deceptively simple, just because you don't need to do anything. It's not an act of doing to imagine into vision. You, you sit down and you, um, you, you can imagine what you could be doing. Or you gain inspiration from what others are doing and you start bringing it into your life. And I think well, there's this real power just you know, through imagination um, to create change. Mm, yeah. Thank you. The other thing I wanted to ask about was um, like uh, points of feedback within this kind of um, system. Because I know, I mean, of course, it's not linear. Um, but the way you present it is, you know, there's a list with uh, obviously the intention being more like the big vision and the action being the the final kind of output. Um, so I was curious about within that way, you think there's like key points of feedback. And I think you've already alluded to one, which is like awareness. Uh, during your awareness, you, you build intention. Um, mm. So I was curious if there's any more within that. Um. So I would say a, a, a thing I would recommend for people with this is um, is not to be too attached to it. So how, so you like um, like a map. You, know, you, you have it as a map. Have it as some kind of mental framework, mental model to come back to occasionally. But uh, whenever you feel like you're in a bit of a rut or a bit stuck, or let's say you catch yourself and you like, you wanted to do this thing, but then you just you know, procrastinating you're not able to create any change that's a, a moment for maybe to think back to actually am i missing something and um i would then get a journal out get a pen and paper out and write down they remind yourself of the five ingredients and I'm like okay have i been taking action and just ask yourself a question you know have i been taking action you know, yes no and then maybe journal a bit elaborate on that yeah you know, have i been um you know, do I have a strategy in place? And, you know, and then maybe you realize, well, actually, I've been taking lots of action, but I have no strategy in place. I'm going in circles. And then you can ask yourself, do I have a, you know, am, I, am I aware of um, what my, you know, of um, uh, what, what, I, what else I could be doing? Uh, like, am I aware of the, what it's doing to my body? So I, as an example, my, my dad, he's got his own business in construction and cleaning, and he's always you know, working himself like near to death. You know, he's like taking so much toll on his body. He's like not getting much sleep. Um, so for him, it's really valuable to bring awareness to his, his physical state because he's you know, constantly in a state of action, drinking eight coffees per day. And uh, yeah, that's no exaggeration. So you ask yourself, you know, am I bringing awareness to my internal state and to you know, what, what's going on outside of me? And you know, do, I, I mean, you know, do I still have my, my vision? Does it, maybe the vision started off as something and maybe it's changed as to where you're at now. Is a vision still 
is it still relevant for you for me does it still feel alive because if, if there's a vision which i had at the beginning but i'm not buying now i feel that yeah, if things have shifted i'm not going to be inspired by it so maybe it's time to revisit it and um, and that one of the most difficult ones is going back to the initial intention especially if you've got sunk costs and you're like well, is this actually what i really want and asking yourself maybe my intention needs to shift and that's happened a few times for me when starting my business and then i've had an idea of what i wanted but actually in the end i was like well i tried it but it doesn't feel good it doesn't feel right for me maybe i need to go in a different direction and adjust course um, so that's how I would say to apply it is journal, get the five, five kind of ingredients and um, ask yourself questions, honestly, just honest questions in, in a period where you're maybe feeling a bit stuck or confused. Yes, uh, Lucia. Lucia, you're on mute. You need to unmute yourself. The lesson. It's okay now? Yes. Cool. Okay. I said, please stop me if I, since I speak three languages all day, all day long, and French is my last one, and I live in France, I sometimes can, um, I don't know. So I will speak based on my life experience or situation right now. Um, at Plum Village, in here in La Dordogne, I met Mark from life itself and um, what's his name, Baez. Uh, and I was very interested, actually it's the first time in my life that I do a Zoom uh, because I've always liked things um, directly. It's the first time in my life at 61 years old that I do get involved in the Zoom. Uh, itself, uh, life itself really attracted me. I've been in France for 13 years. Uh, was in the Caribbean before and United States before. And right now in my life, I'm at a point where I'm not satisfied and I know a shift is going on, but it's been going on for too long where I am stuck. Uh, Plum Village, I was there for two weeks with the Buddhist uh, monastery. It was pretty difficult for me to follow all the practices and stuff. I met beautiful people. But I keep, I'm like stuck. I'm very lonely here. I like to be alone, but it's a deep loneliness. I've had uh, lots of uh, lots of things that happened in my life, losing people, uh, suicides, death. I had a huge depression. And I know I want to live in a community. I really am thinking in going to Bergerac, uh, I'm going to try to go for uh, three months, but I don't, I procrastinate. I stay stuck in, I know what I need to do, but I just, it's like a, like a force stronger than me that holds me down. I just don't make the move. I do know consciously and probably unconsciously that I really need to make something to, to change my life because I'm not satisfied and material stuff, for example, and things like that, I, I they don't really mean anything to me anymore. So I don't know how to make this, make this action, how to make the move because I am blocked, I'm blocked. That's the word, I'm really mm -hmm. with fear to make a move because it's been 13 years I'm running in a circle. So I don't know if this question or this subject I'm bringing out to you makes any sense mm. and uh what will be your opinion or say about it well there's um so the thing that comes to me is this the, this this force you mentioned holding you down and i think the place to start would be to investigate what that is showing up for you um like so bring awareness to that so how does that how does that force keep you down like what how does it show up for you i'm wondering there's a lot of trauma in my life there's a lot of traumatic events uh, and um when i came to france after living in the caribbean i just broke down it's just like i was 48 years old and 
and I feel like I'm a snake changing skin. And I know my values, I know, so I, I'm, I'm scared right now. I said, my God, I'm 61 years old. I'm 13 years, I'm in France. In 10 years, I'll be 71. It's like, and I have a very young spirit and I love to play with people in, in a good way. And I'm just like dying here, you know, and I cannot blame France, but in, in a little bit, I don't blame France, but living with French mentality has been a big shock for me. Because even though it's 44 years, I don't live in South America. Um, I still remain very Latin, very rooted. But actually, I'm rootless right now. I don't mm. feel any roots anywhere. I don't feel Colombian. I don't feel American. I don't feel French, even though I have my passport. So um, I'm like floating. Mm. I feel like I don't have any center in myself. I don't have, I'm not anchored anywhere uh, in myself. I lost even the the roots in my own self. I'm mm. dispersé, dispersed of my own self. Mm. I observe myself a lot. <clears throat> but, you know, I'm, I'm. thank you so much for this and your, your sharing because it's absolutely magic, beautiful, and it really touches me. So... Thank you very much. Uh, I will continue. Uh, and I, I don't know right now. I know I, I feel sometimes like I'm this far from mm. shifting. But mm. there's something that holds me down. Mm. Is it me? Is it my mind? I can be very brainy. Mm. I'm extremely extra hypersensitive. I have a sens uh, sensibility mm. yeah. stream, which I suffer a lot from. Because mm. when you're sensible like me and very empathic, mm. um, you take everything to your heart, you know? Mm. Mm. So, yeah, it's, it's, I'm stuck. I'm stuck and I want to, I feel like I'm drowning and I've been drowning for many years and I keep going, I keep pushing before everybody, oh, yeah, you've been a warrior. I don't want to be a warrior anymore. Me, this word mm. warrior, it doesn't mean nothing anymore. I mm. just I just want to be doing more in my life than existing. Mm. What I what I would um, that's what I picked from from what you said and what stuck out for me was the the word kind of ungrounded or like not in your body. Um, and I so I believe that you can set an intention around that idea of being more grounded, more in your body. And that's the starting point for change. So that number one, set that intention of being more embodied, more grounded, and and maybe think about a vision of what that might look like for you. And you can sit and meditate on this. Um, so visioning is a meditative, can be a meditative activity. It can be a, it can be um, you know, when you're walking in nature, for instance. You know, what what comes to you when you think about being more grounded in your body um, and more part of, let's say. Your, your community, your, your surroundings. Because I'm sure there's other people who feel like you, but also are maybe scared to to uh, to connect. And then and then bring awareness to you know, how you might be able to do that. You find online communities like, like you've done now, uh, which can maybe support you. And uh, you bring awareness to certain activities that you can do, or you know, or or find other people who are empathic, and you know, hear their stories as to how they've get grounded back down and maybe not become, maybe not being as sensitive. Um, and then you put a strategy in place. And what can you do at very small gradual steps? Maybe just one action each week. And maybe like just going for a walk each day uh, might be grounding, for instance, is getting into your body. Um, and, uh, and I think action is something that spans the whole spectrum. Already being here right now, it's a huge move. I said, oh my God, am I going to be able to hold? Am I going to? And I just did it without hesitating or thinking mm -hmm. twice about it. But this is a huge move for me to be here right now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, we're really happy to like welcome and hold space for the individuals, especially wherever they're at on their journey and I feel like what Jan has offered up today and what he's just shared is like the sort of 
latter reflections and a more sort of like directly aligned response to to your situation is something that's super useful to everyone because there's a lot that comes around with change and even if there is that conscious awareness of it it brings up so many different emotions so many different thoughts a real you know battling with like limiting beliefs and conditioning and you know this whole array of emotions that we're all just um as humans consistently like experiencing or avoiding or being exposed to so we are coming to time I'm just gonna um just check in with Nathan is there anything you'd like to to say as we start to like close close this up Nathan any final thoughts or anything no, I don't think so. I just want to say, yeah, thank you again for everyone coming. And Lucia, thank you for, for being here. And I really feel you right here. It's um, very heartwarming that you're you're sharing vulnerably. And um, I think it really brings community together when we can have these experiences. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you all too. I'm really with tears in my eyes. This is like a sangha, you know, sharing. And I always put my heart out. Uh, sometimes I even express too much how I'm feeling, but that's my nature. And I just hope it's it's good for some people that will not talk, but might be going through the same thing I am. Yeah, of course. And I, I feel like vulnerability um, is, is so key to conscious change. So you are definitely leading, leading the way for, for all of us here. So we are now at time.